It's like my wife. Friend or family member, they'd be like, what are you talking about? Oh, we're trying to guess where you want to go, right? That's exactly how we, that's normal. That, if you look at little kids who haven't even been to school yet, that's how they play school. My daughter asking her doll, um, you know, what's this book about? No, think about that some more. It's about ducks, right? And I remember, you know, remember those old anti-drug commercials from the 80s? You know, where did you learn this? I learned it from watching you, Dad. That's, that's exactly, you know, she learned that by the way I was talking to her. Right? We inherit this. It's insidious. Once we know there's a right answer as teachers and parents, we try to drive our students relentlessly to that. And I'm going to share an example and be vulnerable here. I'm going to show you some home video footage of me interacting with my daughter. Just to show you, I've written about this. I know better. My wife said, isn't it stuff you always talk about? And I'm going to do it with the most precious student in my life, my own daughter. Right? It's just very difficult to get over. So if, is there a way to dim the lights maybe a little bit? This inherited pattern of talk that uh, researchers have identified is this is like the meme of teacher talk. If you were to break it down, this is what school talk looks like. The teacher initiates most, if not all, the questions. This is what we've learned as being students ourselves in school. Okay. The student's job is to respond, and our job as a teacher, again, is to immediately evaluate. So you can see it's teacher, student, teacher. And it's usually one student. We tell our students to raise their hand. So I ask a question that I already know the answer to. You respond, and I evaluate whether you got the way I wanted to hear it. And that's how you get successful in school. But we learn this by being students ourselves, right? It, and we just, it saturates us. So even in this conversation with my 18-month-old daughter at the time, watch for this. I ask, she responds, I evaluate. Let's watch it for a second and see. Again, a little piece of me dies every time I show this, but all right, here we go. <laughs> yeah, that's an owl. What's that? Super job. What's that? Turn the page. Penguin. Good. What's that? Penguin. What's that? Look. Look at the moon. That's the sun. Let's look at that. There's the moon. And what's that? What is that? So she later just throws the book. We can just go over at that point. <laughs> right? So again, I asked. She responded. She got what I wanted her to say. I said, super job. Right? Now, I want to know the difference between sun and moon. But I was driving to Chia. Went right back, you can see it was uncomfortable for her. She went right back to Penguin, she's like, forget this. I know a moon when I see it, right? That was just a yellow moon, whatever, Dad. Um, <laughs> and so pretty soon reading time was over. And again, there's this tension. We want our students to know the difference. We want them to know the correct way of doing things. But kind of driving relentlessly to it is not the way. And so the simple move, and we'll end this and take a break, is, is to explore first. That curiosity. If I just simply ask, oh, why do you call that the moon? What is the moon, right? You can explore that. You can explore that first. When Kelly says, doctors have messy handwriting, explore first and then evaluate. What we inherit is the impulse to evaluate immediately. And our students want that. I mean, they, they expect that from us because they learn how to be successful in school too. So I just want you to watch in your own practice. Are you asking no answer questions? And sometimes it's okay to do that. I'm not saying, that's ineffective all the time. But is that, is that what you typically ask? Questions you already know the answer to. And then if you are given a surprising response, do you immediately evaluate or do you explore it? Just watch that in your own practice. And I think by making a slight adjustment of just exploring, saying, tell me a little bit more about that, I think you will be shocked at what's underneath, the many key ideas that are there. We're going to show you some examples of that. But now I see that we're all fading. So we're going we're gonna to stop at our 10.30 mark, like I said. We'll get up, we'll refresh, and then we're going to start <coughs> workshopping some of these ideas. All right, so thank you for your you. attendance and participation, and we'll reconvene here in a moment. That I had to tell my family when I came back from my doctoral studies, and then I tell all my students and everyone I ever talked to, I'm not the kind of doctor that gives out prescriptions. <laughs>
and leaders James, we shouldn't be no. giving out prescriptions. Yeah. I think what we're trying to do is just stimulate ideas. We both firmly believe it's already within your own practice. Creativity is something that we don't give to people. You have it. Right? It's a human trait. We all have it. So it's just about allowing you to recognize it in your own practice and give it voice and to help that with your students, help them recognize it within their own um, learning and life as well. So we just want to highlight a few more pieces and then we're going to start moving into like, so how do we breathe new life into a lesson that maybe you dread to teach? So this is like when we're actually teaching, when we get caught in the unexpected. I think what we want to do is really ask ourselves, are we okay with uncertainty? I think something that I notice with prospective teachers, people that want to become teachers, they really feel like, I don't know where this lesson's going, then I must not be competent as a teacher. And I think what really creative teachers do is they realize the best teaching comes from doing a lot of planning and structuring the experience, but not knowing how it's going to turn out. Right? You don't know where a project's really going to go. You don't really know what a student might say, but trusting yourself as experts to work with it. Those are the most rewarding days as teachers is when we're surprised by how something turns out. And so I think allowing yourself to kind of dwell in the uncertainty is where you can really release creativity in yourself and others. And trusting your expertise. So that's why to say, take some time to explore first. I mean, think about why did you go into teaching? It probably, you would have never imagined the common core. It's not like, I want to teach you because I hope someday there will be a common core. I mean, forget about it. No way, right? Because you enjoyed the subject matter. You were curious about it. You, there was something about it, right? There's something about the act of teaching that drew you to it. And so I think it, we have to sometimes remind ourselves, why am I even doing this? Because it's exhausting work. Sometimes it's thankless work. But I think it is the most important work. It really is. And we don't always hear that. Um, but I think try to retap into why did you get into this profession in the first place? And trust yourself to explore and be curious. And I think that, that's where you can really start seeing some creativity. So if we return to our opening vignette, where we have two students, Bruce. Lighting is bad. Kelly. Doctors should have neater handwriting. What do we do with this? We talked about before, you know, we don't want to fall down the curricular rabbit hole by chasing Kelly's comments to where we're, we're falling endlessly. Something I've seen um, effective teachers do when they don't know what to do with an idea, so it's kind of like learning what to do when you don't know what to do, is just put a section of their chalkboard where they have a, a sticky, big sticky note on the wall they call the idea parking lot. Does anybody use idea parking lot in here? So this is what you do. This, the nice thing about idea parking lot is it keeps you honest with the students. We often say any ideas, we'll, we'll take any question or idea, um, but then we, what I, I, I have a book called Killing Ideas Softly. What I often say is we sometimes drop students out and they're sharing their ideas in earnest and we don't know what to do with them. So we dismiss them and say something nice, like, why don't you think about that a little bit more, or we'll move to somebody else. The experience of that for some students is to actually stifle their ideas. They're like, it's too, too tenuous, it's too fragile. And they're like, I just got dismissed, right? Yeah, I basically got told to talk to the hand. What the idea parking lot does is if you don't know what to do with an idea because you really have to cover this in the next 10 minutes, and this kid's talking about doctor's handwriting, one strategy is to write it on the board and say, tomorrow, we're coming back to you. And you leave it up there. And the students will keep you honest. And maybe you start tomorrow's lesson by revisiting, OK, so Callie, you said that. So the idea parking lot is a place to park ideas where you may not know what to do with. And to hold you accountable, you're not killing the idea. You're coming back to it, just not right now. And that, I think that's a totally legitimate practice that can actually help you out, where you can put those up there and return to if you have to do something else. But what happens then when we return to this, when we go back? How do we do that? So remember, we talked about going from mini C, the kid's idea is the mini C. How do we push it into little C? How do we help Bruce become more creative, original? How do we help Callie become more task appropriate? So we talked about something we call the Goldilocks principle. And basically, it's this idea that it's this tightrope we walk giving feedback between whether it's too harsh, too soft, or just right. And there's too harsh feedback. We all know the danger of too harsh feedback. Now, um, 
A phenomenon that I'm really interested in, and I just published a study on this, and I've talked to James about this a lot, um, is this what I call creative mortification. Again, it's not that 